Good morning, metalheads of the internet, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Metal Meltdown. Today, we're not talking about metal. No sir, no siree Bob. Today, by semi-popular demand, we are instead talking about hip-hop and rap music. Today, we are not the Metal Meltdown. We are the... Uh, I probably should have come up with a name beforehand. What are we now? Thank you, Chumpy. That is excellent. Today, we are the Hip Hop Hoedown. You know what, Chumpy? Now that I say that out loud, that's kind of dumb. I don't really like that. What else you got? The Rap Rambunction. Is rambunction a real word? That doesn't feel like a real word. Chompy, that might actually be the most offensive thing you've ever said. I'm I'm not repeating that. We're gonna stick with the first one, Hip Hop Hoedown. It's it's not great, but it's better than that. God damn, I, I kind of think differently of you now, Chompy. I uh we need to have a talk later. We you you and me. We need we need to have a little talk, alright? It, it can wait. It doesn't have to be now. We're we're gonna talk later. As the metal meltdown has broadened its horizons and expanded and blossomed, there's been a bit of demand uh, to talk about hip hop and rap music in some capacity, to talk about just another style of music in general in some capacity, because I've made it clear that is, you know, even though this is called the metal meltdown, I just really like music in general. I like talking about music. That's kind of why I do this. And I especially really like hip hop and rap music because I just think that there are a lot of really unique voices in that genre. Uh, I think that there's so much like really innovative and challenging and frankly beautiful stuff coming out of hip-hop and rap music today. So today what I'm kind of doing is I'm giving you a metalhead's guide to hip-hop and rap music. Telling you about some of the classic albums, albums that helped me change my mind about hip-hop and rap music and also helped me just broaden my musical palette, and I'm also going to tell you about some weirder, darker albums that I think metalheads specifically, specifically if you're into the really weird, dark, extreme stuff, can really get into. And let's start off by talking about a few classic artists and albums. Now, we could probably do a whole episode talking about like the golden age of hip-hop and 90s hip-hop and gangster rap. There's so much great, provocative, insightful, challenging stuff out there, stuff that holds up like 30, 40 years years later. Stuff from NWA, Public Enemy, Run DMC, Tupac, the Notorious B.I.G., the list goes on and on. Today I specifically want to talk about like a few artists and albums uh, that, that I've personally enjoyed the most and have had the biggest impact on me. First up, the Beastie Boys, pioneers of hip-hop. They're one of those hip-hop groups that even if you don't like hip-hop, you kind of like Beastie Boys. Like, my mom hates hip-hop. She hates rap music. But if Fight for Your Right to Party starts playing on the radio, she will sing along. They just have a mass appeal that transcends typical hip-hop genre borders and barriers, and I think a big reason as to why that is the case is because their music is just so fun and energetic. Like, your typical Beastie Boys banger and jam is filled with pounding drums and driving riffs and beats and clever samples and it's loud and in your face. I think that them also having some origins in like punk rock and specifically the New York hardcore scene definitely helps with that. Like they, there's definitely a lot that they learn from being a punk hardcore band that they brought into hip hop. License to Ill is often regarded as one of the best hip hop debut albums of all time and one of the best hip hop rap albums in general. And I would definitely recommend you check that out. But but I would more specifically recommend albums like Paul's Boutique and Check Your Head. Paul's Boutique, because I think this is Beastie Boys at their most creative, like the way that they're using samples across this album to create new beats and new rhythms and new dynamics, that's really exciting. And back in the day, that was kind of revolutionary. And Check Your Head, because I really like the really raw, organic sound and feel of this. The next kind of like classic hip hop act artist band I kind of want to talk about is A Tribe Called Quest. They remain one of my favorites because everything about their sound just feels so real and human and down to earth. Like everyone in Tribe Called Quest just had this amazing chemistry. They really brought out the best in each other. They really challenged each other. They really pushed each other. It doesn't matter whether A Tribe Called Quest is talking about more political, social, economic issues and struggles. It doesn't matter whether they're just talking about 
daily life kind of stuff and trying to be more positive and trying to spread like happier, healthier messages and vibes. It doesn't matter whether they're just kind of being goofy and just, you know, fucking around and playing around with funky beats and licks and rhythms and riffs and such, you know? Everything about A Tribe Called Quest just feels so human. I love how they use samples. I love how they use rich, warm, organic bass and guitar tones and like drums and horns and such. I love how they incorporate jazz and classic rock and R&B and soul influence into their sound. Their first three albums, People's Instinctive Travels, The Low End Theory, and Midnight Marauders, stand as some of the most influential and critically acclaimed nearly 30 years later. That being said, I would actually recommend you check out literally anything in the A Tribe Called Quest discography because honestly, it's all fantastic. 2016's We Got It From Here, Thank You For Your Service Especially, was kind of an amazing album. It did a great job at bringing back the classic A Tribe Called Quest sound and vibe and style and also tackling like issues of the time, you know, racial politics and social and economic issues of the time, the incoming Trump administration. Hell, this is one of those rare instances where honestly you really could get away with just getting a greatest hits album because all of their hits were great. How do you pick when every album is fucking great? The final classic era hip hop artist I kind of want to talk about is Outkast. And this is kind of where we start dipping our toes into Robert's gateway into hip hop and rap music territory because I remember in the early 2000s when Outkast were at like their peak of fame and popularity and songs like Miss Jackson, uh, The Way You Move, Hey Ya were being played on pop radio all the fucking time and I loved it. Like I loved those fucking songs and this is before, before I'm into hip hop, like really into it obviously and before I'm even really into metal or music. Like I'm just a dumb fucking kid Autistic as fucking hell, that hasn't changed. And I'm just loving these fucking songs and having fucking fun. And they kind of stuck with me all through the years. And then when I'm finally really into hip hop and exploring hip hop, I'm like, I got to revisit Outkast. So I go back to those records, Tanconia and Speaker Box The Love Below, as well as other stuff like Atlians and Aquemini. Aquemini? What, 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 what was the exact title again? I guess it's supposed to be called Aquemini, I guess. I don't know. It's great. That's what matters. Earlier records definitely have like a dirtier, edgier kind of feel and vibe to them. Maybe leaning more towards like gangster rap than like full on like progressive rap, southern hip hop, alternative hip hop, whatever you want to call it. But they're still really fucking cool. Love the energy. Love the attitude of these records. Uh, I would say that I definitely prefer like Stanconia and Speaker Box Love Below. I definitely have a bit of a nostalgic attachment to these records. To be fair, I will acknowledge a little bit of bias on my end. But I also just feel like these records being more expansive, bringing in like influence from rave music, from gospel music, and just having like so many great memorable songs. Like I just feel like they're stronger records from start to finish. All right, now we're kind of moving on to the artists and albums that got me into hip hop. We're talking about the artists and albums that were officially my gateway into hip hop and rap music because as much as we love all these classic artists, they weren't really what really introduced me or what got me excited about hip hop and rap music. Hell, I grew up in the 2000s, so frankly, most of the bands we just talked about, like Beastie Boys and A Tribe Called Quest, they weren't active in this time. You know, like not not really, at least not in the same way they were in the 80s and 90s. Okay, well I guess Outkast was still kicking, but not for long. In the 2000s, the primary force in hip hop, I would say was probably Eminem. And I didn't really get into Eminem till like much later, probably like maybe early 2010s. Uh, but I remember buying the Marshall Mathers LP on CD in a Walmart in like fucking Youngstown, New York, like just outside Niagara Falls ish territory. And that was the first hip hop rap album I ever bought. And I bought it out of pure curiosity because I was already aware of Eminem for a while and I, I just didn't care. And I ended up really connecting with this album despite being like a metalhead at this point, despite being, as I said before, a generic shitty metal elitist, uh, because it was such a dark and brutal album lyrically and conceptually. Like across the album, 
in all of the lyrics and in all of these little skits, you have Eminem describing like extreme acts of violence and abuse and torture. He talks about abusing and hurting family members. He talks about drug and alcohol abuse. He talks about the weird relationship he has with his fans in the song Stan specifically. He kind of talks about uh, someone like an obsessive fanboy who at a certain point in the song is arguably stalking Eminem and has uh, exaggerated the relationship between the artist and the person like absorbing and consuming and buying the art. And by the end of the song, the fan in question is professing his love to Eminem. And in the process, he also murders his girlfriend, drowning both of them by driving their car into a lake. And all of this is communicated through like handwritten notes that are delivered to Eminem. And then Eminem, as Eminem, responds and realizes kind of the impact of his lyrics and his actions. And it's a pretty like brutal moment. And throughout the album as well, he talks about how he struggles with dealing with fame and success and notoriety. And this was all stuff that 16, 17 year old metalhead Robert felt he really understood and related to. Very obviously, he didn't. I, I cannot now relate to a lot of the things that Eminem talks about on this album. But I, I think that a lot of it is worth exploring. I think that it's really interesting. I think it's like a time capsule of everything like fucked up and strange and unique about Eminem in the early 2000s. I guess we can't really talk about like rap and hip hop gateway albums for metalheads without also talking about Rage Against the Machine. Now, by the time I was listening to Rage Against the Machine, they had been inactive for well over a decade, hadn't released an album, very little touring, I kind of first heard about Rage Against the Machine through Guitar Hero 3 because I remember there was like a level where you're performing in a prison and Tom Morello came out and you did like a guitar duel and then you played Bulls on Parade with him. It was so fucking goofy and silly. But I think I really got into Rage Against the Machine right around the time I was getting into Eminem because I was looking for more like kind of provocative, like metal adjacent kind of rap and hip hop music and Rage Against the Machine popped on my radar because they were technically speaking, a metal band. I think a lot of Rage Against the Machine's music has aged really well, not just because it's so musically unique and distinctive, but also because the lyrics remain really relevant to a lot of people. That being said, my favorite of the bunch would be The Battle of Los Angeles. Like this, more than any other Rage Against the Machine album, was my motherfucking jam when I was starting to get into hip hop, and it remains my favorite album of theirs to this day. And on that note, I guess we also can't talk about hip-hop gateway albums for metalheads without also talking about the infamous Body Count, the crossover thrash rap metal side project of gangster rap icon Ice-T. This was a band born out of Ice-T's genuine love and interest in heavy metal and thrash metal music. Like, Ice-T genuinely loved, like, Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath and Metallica and Slayer, and he wanted to kind of break away from hip-hop and incorporate those influences into his sound, and that kind of eventually turned into a new band, Body Count, whose debut self-titled album arguably stands still as one of the most controversial, infamous, and offensive albums ever made. Primarily because of the song Cop Killer, which to be honest, we could make an entire video talking about specifically just this one song. And some people have. In fact, while we're on the topic, might I recommend you check out a video that Killbot and Gorgor Attack did on Cop Killer. I'm not gonna lie, I'm not a huge fan of a lot of other stuff that Body Count did in the 90s and 2000s. It just wasn't as interesting in my opinion. That being said, Body Count have kind of sort of been on a roll uh, since 2014, so much so that this has become Ice-T's main musical project. Now as far as artists and albums that really truly got me into hip-hop are concerned, uh, there's one particular album from one particular artist that we now need to really focus on. To Pimp a Butterfly from Kendrick Lamar. Like, listening to this album specifically was the moment where everything suddenly clicked. Kendrick Lamar, I think, is one of the best lyricists in the game right now. A full-blown fucking poet, honestly. His stuff deals with a wide variety of social, political, uh, and economic issues. It deals with generational trauma. It deals with systemic oppression, police brutality. 
It dissects black culture and expectations for young men, especially young black men. And Tapimba Butterfly is, in my opinion, the best of the best. There's so much that's amazing about this album. I love how throughout the album, he's kind of conducting a mock interview with his idol, Tupac Shakur, and reciting little bits of a poem that is only finally pieced together by the very end. I also love some of the wild production and bass work, courtesy of Thundercat, a prominent collaborator on the album. I like all of the other contributions made by other collaborators, like uh, Snoop Dogg and George Clinton. Clinton. I love the jazzy, I love the jazzy, intimate, emotional feel of If These Walls Could Talk. I love the incredibly heavy uh, tone of The Black or the Berry. This is the album I would specifically recommend. This was the official gateway into hip hop for me, but everything else Kendrick has done is great as well. Like Good Kid Mad City, uh, Untitled Unmastered, Damn, Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers, even his like contributions to the Black Panther soundtrack. Unironically kind of awesome. Shortly after falling in love with Tapimba Butterfly, I remember my friend Moose introducing me to MF Doom and specifically the album Oom um Food. Now I like a lot of the stuff that MF Doom has made. Uh, the Mad Villainy record with Mad Lib, another full-blown fucking classic. I love Take Me to Your Leader, which was released by MF Doom under the alias King Ghidorah, but Mmm Food remains the banger, the number one, the all-time classic for me. I really like the kind of like hip hopified Doctor Doom persona that MF Doom has on this album. I like the lyrics about like food. I like how witty and clever it is. I like how corny and cheesy it is. The album has a really good sense of humor. I like how old samples from like the Fantastic Four cartoon from like the fucking 60s, 70s, whatever, was brought in to kind of like complement the kind of like Doctor Doom villain theme and persona. Probably some of the most unique lyrics and vibes and production work I've heard on any hip hop albums of this day. Tabimba Butterfly is my number one all time hip hop album, but this is easily number two. And through MF Doom, I am soon introduced to Zarface, who similarly kind of brings in like comic book references and Easter eggs and shit like that. He kind of also adopts this villainous super villain persona. But a lot of what Zarface specifically does is applied more so to like that kind of like golden age classic hip hop sound and formula. Of everything Zarface did, I think Every Hero Needs a Villain is my favorite. I just think every song on here is so catchy, so memorable, so fun. But there's a lot of other good stuff as well, like A Fistful of Peril and the collab albums with Ghostface Killa and, surprise, the aforementioned MF Doom. And finally, wrapping up this gateway album section of this video, I want to talk about Run the Jewels. Now, I was actually introduced to Run the Jewels through the Meow the Jewels album which was a really weird remix of Run the Jewels 2, their sophomore studio album, in which all the beats and instruments were replaced with samples of cats meowing and purring. And I remember there was this music video too that just had all these weird like cat visuals and it was really psychedelic and trippy. It kind of fucked me up. I remember watching that with Moose and we were, we were having some edibles and shit. And uh, yeah, it was uh, on, on the same level of terrifying and emotional as uh, literally watching the Cats musical movie, which I also watched on Edibles. And that's also an experience I would recommend everyone go through it at least once. Unironically, I'm getting off topic. Run the Jewels is really cool because they combine, in my opinion, the best elements of old school golden age hip hop and also more modern hip hop. Killer Mike and LP also just have like incredible fucking chemistry. They're bringing the best elements from all of the albums that they've released and that they've worked on and that they've produced separately. And and they're bringing that together and it, it just results in some seriously fucking awesome fucking stuff. I would specifically recommend Run the Jewels 4, their most recent studio album. That album is also pretty important to me because it came out in 2020 and obviously, you know, COVID-19, the pandemic, all that stuff, quarantine. I was at home a lot of the time and I spent a lot of time like working out, lifting weights, running on the treadmill, shit like that. And this was like my workout album for like a long fucking time. Like I unironically lost like 70, 80 pounds or so throughout 2020 leading into 2021, listening specifically 
to this fucking album. Okay, we've arrived at what is the final part of this video. I've told you about some classic hip hop. I've told you about albums that are really important to me because they made me love and appreciate hip hop. And now I kind of want to just tell you about some really fucking weird, crazy, dark hip hop in general. Like we're talking about music that is genuinely kind of demented and is arguably heavier and darker than, frankly, a lot of metal music that you could maybe name right now. And we're gonna start this final part of this video by talking about Def Grips, who a lot of you might already know to some extent. I've met a lot of metal heads who will make an exception for Def Grips because their sound is so weird, so intense, so noisy, so chaotic. Def Grips have a really unique sound combining industrial and punk and metal and underground hip hop into something just totally fucking crazy and intense. Like they've kind of made a name for themselves by just making really unhinged music and just by doing really unhinged shit. To the point where Def Grips are also like a total fucking meme, like within like music nerd fucking circles and shit like that. I think for a metalhead and for like a true connoisseur of extreme and underground music, records like Year of the Snitch and Bottomless Pit would be really appealing. But my personal favorite out of everything in their discography is their iconic debut, The Money Store. I think this does the best job at taking everything that is so chaotic and unhinged and wild about Def Grips, but like turning it into something that's like, it actually resembles real music, you know? Like there are some hooks on this album, there are some beats on this album. It gets me hype as fuck. I also wanna talk about Clipping, an experimental hip hop trio featuring Davy Diggs, who you might recognize from various film and TV productions like Blind Spotting, Velvet Buzzsaw, Snowpiercer, for all my theater kids out there, you might also recognize Davy Diggs from the Tony and Grammy Award winning hip hop musical Hamilton. But we're not talking about that shit, okay? We're talking about clipping because clipping is where Davy Diggs is kind of a little freak, kind of a little weirdo. Clipping specializes in experimental and industrial hip hop with influences from horrorcore, uh, with very like noisy, angular sounds and patterns and production, with thought provoking, uh, often very edgy lyricism as well. I'm going to recommend the albums there existed in Addiction to Blood and Visions of Bodies Being Burned specifically because these albums uh, together examine and dissect and analyze like real and fictional horror in a way that is graphic, in a way that is genuinely kind of scary and creepy. It's interesting to see parallels being drawn between fictionalized uh, drama and violence and horror and also very real life violence and drama and horror. There are some soundscapes and progressions here that quite literally sound like nails on a chalkboard. It's grating and uncomfortable and it sends a chill down your spine. Davy Diggs' lyricism and his flow and his energy and his tone is honestly kind of incredible as well. I would genuinely make an argument that he's probably one of the best like lyricists and MCs in all of hip hop. Next up, I wanna talk about Danny Brown, another very unique voice within the realms of like modern hip hop. Every album that he makes kind of feels like a little snapshot in time. Like it very perfectly captures everything that Danny Brown is feeling and experiencing in that moment. He's one of the most like vulnerable and revealing people in all of hip hop. Like he's not afraid to let it all bear. 2013's Old is a very underrated album. I like how introspective and revealing he is on that album while producing like some really fun kind of like hip hop jams that like balance uh, old school and modern tones similar to that of like Run the Jewels. Like I'm also reminded of like some classic Outkast on that album. Uh, but I wanna specifically highlight uh, the Atrocity Exhibition from 2017 because I feel like this is Danny Brown at his most vulnerable and revealing. This is also probably Danny's most varied and progressive album, musically speaking, from start to finish. You have influences from across the spectrums of underground and experimental and alternative hip hop, as well as soul music and post-punk. It's a very anxious record. It's a very uncomfortable record. If you dig what you're hearing here, I would recommend also checking out some stuff from Injury Reserve and JPEG Mafia, the latter of whom Danny Brown worked with pretty recently on last year's critically acclaimed 
and Scaring the Hose. That was my favorite rap album from last year, actually, honestly. One of my favorite albums of the year in general. So fun. So cool. Love all the creative samples and the weird vibe. You have two of, like, hip-hop's most distinctive and depressing voices just, like, letting loose, letting their freak flag fly. It's awesome. So good to hear. And the last artist I want to really talk about today is Backwash, who is probably one of the most unique voices in hip-hop and rap music today. Over the past couple of years, she has released a trilogy of albums. God has nothing to do with it, leave him out of this. I lie here bared with my rings and my dresses, and his happiness shall come first even though we are suffering, which deals with her experiences as a trans woman, trying to get along with family members, dealing with... Uh, religious bigotry dealing with homophobia and transphobia. She talks a lot about hypocrisy and religion and just the experience of being a black trans woman making hip-hop and rap music. And she brings in a lot of uh, metal and rock influence into that. Like, it's normal on these albums to have screaming vocals and metal percussion and gritty guitar tones. And it's also normal to hear, like, musical interludes inspired by Godspeed You Black Emperor, samples taken from, like, metal bands like Black Sabbath, as well as, like, gothic choral vocals and just, like, totally unhinged, like, vocal work and production stuff. I really can't think of anyone out there who's writing and performing music like this. Like, she is, again, in my opinion, one of the most unique voices out there. And she's been one of the best over the last few years. And you know what? Let's give a quick shout out to Horror and Soul Glow, two bands that are doing a really great job at combining, like, horrorcore and industrial hip-hop and hardcore punk into just, like, totally brutal, pulverizing, punishing music. The albums United States of Horror and Diaspora Problems, uh, respectively, specifically, uh, I, I think are fucking fantastic and you should absolutely check out. All right, I think that does it. We've talked about what, like 15, 20 different fucking artists in this fucking video. Everything from classic hip hop to modern hip hop, underground hip hop, industrial hip hop, like punk hip hop, rap metal, southern hip hop, gangster rap. I've talked so much about hip hop. You asked for it. You got it. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope I was able to introduce you to some cool new hip-hop i hope i was able to teach you a little bit and i hope that you check out all of the albums i've talked about and all of the artists i've talked about in case you haven't already now it's your turn in the comment section below to tell me more about some fucking cool hip-hop what were some of your gateway albums what are some albums that you love that maybe i should have i should have mentioned but i didn't and now you just want to talk about them let me know let me know if you also want to see more videos like this in the future i don't know like a metalhead's guide to fucking Country music, I don't fucking know. A Metalhead's Guide to Jazz. Actually, that one might be cool. I would maybe do that. But let me know, just in case. I don't do these things unless I think you don't... I mean, I'll do it because I want to, but it helps if I know that people will actually tune in. I'm not gonna lie. Like, it, 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 it makes a difference. Straight the fuck up. I'm rambling. We're done here. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. Press this button to subscribe. Look, there's even more videos here. And as always, you have yourself a fantastic fucking day.